Hello, this is Josh, and welcome back to Inside the Music, or welcome to Inside the Music if this is your first time. So today, we're on our second lesson of developing skills for the tenor horn. And today is going to be a really exciting lesson because we are diving deep into the world of dynamics and articulation, which is one of the most fundamental parts of music making ever. A lot of music uses dynamics, it uses articulation, how it makes every piece of music so expressive is like the word I keep using, it's about expressing the music, expressing the art, and these kind of different ways of writing symbols or writing different meanings are important because when a musician reads them, it indicates how to play a certain note a certain way, or how to express a sound, the volume, how to maybe change it, and a lot of these things are very effective in making some really like emotional pieces of music or sometimes dramatic or sometimes some relaxing music. Any type of genre you think of or any type of kind of music you'd listen to will use any form of articulation. There's lots of different things that can be used. There is a lot of stuff and we're just gonna go over a few of them. So we're gonna go over maybe some of the basics that you get to see, but on top of that, we're also gonna just go and look at some more maybe difficult pieces. So for example, I have a piece ready to look at and we're going to look at the dynamic markings. We're going to look at how each part is broken down. So for today, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at different dynamics. That's the first thing. So maybe some common dynamic markings you see, but also some of the Italian names for them as in a lot of the terms that you may come across will be Italian. So for example, you might have crescendo. And crescendo means something which we'll go into shortly. And there's a few other ones that we can use that kind of express how to play a certain note or how to play certain sounds. And then moving on to that, we're then going to be looking at some common forms of articulation. So maybe things that you'll see often when playing music for the tenor horn especially. And how these are really important to create something really expressive and not something that's just a bit uh, bland as we would say or doesn't have a lot of uh, form to it so that's going to be one of the things we're also going to be looking at some written dynamics so we're going to inspect the piece that I've picked out and we're going to maybe look at maybe where there's some dynamic markings and how maybe where it's written is being put there for a specific reason maybe the forte for example is being written somewhere for a specific reason then piano later on why does that, why have they been written there? And we'll get to maybe look over that. As well as that, we'll then use those pieces to look at the articulation. So maybe what's written on top of the notes, maybe what's written next to the notes, and why they've been put there, and why it's so effective in creating a piece of music. And maybe some of the ways that notes are written, for example, and maybe why that kind of use of, you know, theory makes an effective sound, and maybe why the composer did that. So that's what's going to be today. We've got a couple of pieces lined up that I want to look over and I'm really excited to do that because these are pieces that I played um, a while back now, maybe a year or two ago, and they're really enjoyable and I've had a really good time practicing them and being really expressive with them. It was really fun and getting to play them at the end and hear it, you're like, you know, really happy with it. So I'm hoping that these will be too when you have your own pieces of music to play or even listen to and you then have another appreciation for maybe your favourite song you're like, oh I didn't really think about that, maybe that change of tempo or that, um, that use of dynamic, it really adds more to it. So that's the whole point of today, it's to kind of enlighten us a little bit and go over some, uh, some really like interesting facts and details. So without further ado, let's get straight into the lesson then. So what are we starting with? We're starting with the dynamics. So there's a lot of different kind of use of dynamics throughout music. Some really more common ones that we see are like the crescendos and your diminuendos. And a crescendo means you're gradually getting louder. So it would mean you would start to be quiet and you're just gradually building that little volume up. You're increasing in volume. And diminuendo is the exact opposite. You're gradually getting quieter. So you might be really loud and you might be wanting to go down to quiet. Then maybe be a bit more expressive in this area, but then be really expressive in this area. You can kind of see, you can project your sound more or you can be, you know, really quiet. But you can see the effects. So you can be really loud, you can be really quiet, and you can kind of hear the differences. And in some cases, loud is better, quiet is better because it allows for more expression. It can be more dramatic 
depending on what the piece is written for as well. So those are kind of like some that you see. You also maybe see, maybe you might see 40, you might see, for example, you might see like a thing called Fort Sando, which is almost like reinforcing a sound. So Fort Sando is to like reinforce and maybe, you know, give some gradual emphasis on a sound. So you might see that little, like maybe it might be like a, it's like an, uh, what is it, an S with an F and a Z. So Fort Sando. Uh, what else you can get is you can get piano, you can get pianissimo, you can get mezzo piano, you get mezzo forte, you can get forte, you can get fortissimo, and so on. And what we'll do is we'll quickly say, so piano is quiet. So that's like if you're down here, you're really quiet, and then you have forte up here, which is loud. Mezzo forte would be a bit below that, so it's moderately loud. Mezzo piano is like moderately quiet, and then you have your fortissimo, which is loud, like really loud, and your pianissimo is like really quiet. And you can go beyond that. There's like three, you can have three P's together, you can have three F's together, you can have even four. Um, don't know why. That would be basically be screaming down the instrument at that point. You may as well. It'd be really loud. It's basically just being as loud as you can, almost. But fortissimo is being really loud, being really expressive. And you can actually change yourself as the musician, how quiet piano is and how loud forte is. So you could maybe make forte fortissimo, for example, and you can maybe make piano pianissimo. As the, and basically, you can change how they sit. So you can maybe, oh, mezzo piano, it could be a bit here, it could be about here. My mezzo forte can be a bit up here, my forte can be up here, my piano could be down here. You can change that yourself as a musician to be expressive and allow for more effect. So that's kind of some of the dynamics you'd maybe see. And if I show one of the pieces off, so the one of the pieces I picked was called The Queen of the Night's Aria. And this was originally composed by Mozart. And he did this as um, a play part of the Magic Flute which was an, an opera that was performed back when he was alive, of course, composing. And the part we play is almost like the main singer, but it's it's been rearranged for E-flat tenor horn solo. And if I quickly show, that is the whole piece here. So it's quite large. And if I show you some of the dynamic markings, you can kind of see there... You can see a bit of forte, you can see some dots above notes as well. And we're going to go over all of that because that's all articulation, it's all dynamics. And all of those have been specifically placed to create effect. And that's exactly what we're looking over today. And maybe what I'll do is I'll play a little section from one of the bits. You get to hear it and you get to kind of hear how it's expressed. And of course you have your tempo marking. So the tempo marking here says Allegro in Athe which means fast enough in English. That's the translation. And of course, it is a fast piece, but when I originally did it, we slowed down the tempo quite a bit because that made it more dramatic. Obviously, playing it at the original speed would still create a good effect, but if you change some aspects of a piece, you can make it really expressive and dramatic yourself. And another piece I have here as well, of course, is the famous Raiders March by John Williams for Indiana Jones, and that was another one I played, and I really enjoyed that one, and that one's got quite a lot of expressive markings, and it's got some actual um, little symbols that you might not see, so maybe that'll be a good one to go over as well, so those are the two pieces we're going to maybe look over a little bit, it's not going to be um, extensive, but these pieces we'll, we'll play next lesson, of course I said we we're going to be doing some playing, so we're going to use these two pieces, and maybe another one, to play, and then after our discussion, you're almost going to get to hear some of these dynamic markings. And you maybe get to hear some of the changes in the kind of the sound that we have. So that's going to be really good. And we're going to get to hear that in action as well. So we've seen some of the dynamics. We've got our 40. Uh, so for um, if we look at the Queen of Knights area, we do in fact have a 40 marking, which means loud. So the piece can start off really loud. And it's got it's also got a marking above it that says dramatical. And of course, that translates to dramatic. So basically, um, you're playing loud and dramatic. And then since we slowed down the tempo originally, we can make it really expressive. So loud and dramatic, that's two markings of dynamic and almost like a way of playing your, your notes, your articulation, how to kind of maybe think about it. So you want to be in the sense of like, you want this to be dramatic. How to, can I make this dramatic? Loud, and forceful, powerful stuff like that, it allows you to kind of maybe create your own little uh, kind of atmosphere for yourself. And if we keep looking, 
there's some other symbols which are forms of articulation which we can quickly move on to then. So, for one of them, there is a line above the note and we can see it here where my finger is, there's one there. And what that is, is that is called a tenuto marking. And tenuto means holding the note for its full length. So if you have a minimum and you have a tenuto line, it means hold that minimum for its whole length. Because sometimes you might let go a little bit earlier. You might do like one and or something like one. Because obviously it's one, two, one, two, so on. So they want you to make sure you hold that for its full length, its full name. The same with a semi brief for example. If you put a tenuto line above a semi brief you would get, you'd play it for its full value. So you play it for four beats, its full beat as well. So that's what a tenuto is. And some other markings that we see, um, for example, little dots above the notes, and those are called staccato notes. And staccato means short and detached. It's basically playing it like ta, 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 instead of ta, 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 ta. So if I grab an instrument quickly, because obviously, of course, I always have it on hand. Let me play four Gs as legato, so just smooth, and then I'll play them for staccato. So. You can hear the difference. So. And you can kind of see how... Sometimes that might create some effects, some really good effects actually. So it allows for the composer to kind of maybe express an idea and can make it more dramatic as well. Some of these effects are really important and these kind of articulations change the way you play, of course. And sometimes it's for the better. It fits a lot better. It changes the scene. Because almost you can have a picture in your head, maybe if you're listening to this piece of music, or you can imagine the sounds and then suddenly you've got this other sound and it draws you in again. You're, oh, I've not heard that. That's a new rhythm, for example. It's a new sound. It's a new form of articulation you're hearing. And it's, you know, it's exactly why it's written in music because it's effective. It draws the listener back in. It keeps them enticed. It wants them to listen. They want to hear more. So that's another marking. And of course, we went over in our previous lessons, went over some slurring and legato. So legato is smooth, it's tied notes. It's basically no breaks between each note. So it's like moving gently, lightly between them. But obviously if you slur, if you, if you have um, legato, it's playing it smoothly. And if you have your slurred notes, it's keeping them going, keep the flow going without a break. So there's no detachment of the notes, as we would say. If you're playing tongue, there's detached notes from each other, so you can hear each note. Whereas if you're playing it like legato and smooth and slurred, they're all intertwined almost, and they all work really well together. And as fold, if I was to do that really quickly. You can hear how expressive it is. And obviously if I was to play it again really quickly, like... gaps there. So sometimes using legato and kind of slurring allows you to express even further. It allows for these kind of musical ideas to push through and it creates a whole different sound. It's almost like having two different ideas. You can have one tongue, you can have one legato. Two different things almost. It's, it's, it's how effective these dynamics are and these articulations really change. Another one you might see is an accent. It's almost like a little small um, diminuendo above a note and that basically just means like it's marked, you want to play it forcefully. So you're almost power, like you're putting power into the note. So obviously you have your 40 dynamics markings or you may have your mezzo 40 for your volume, but if you have like a 40 and an accent, you're being loud and forceful to the note that has it played. But if it has it marked above it, you play it forceful. And another one you might come up against in some pieces is called a fermata, which is actually a pause. So that is like a little kind of like curved line with a dot in the middle. And that is like to stop or to pause. And what that means is you can hold the note longer than its intended value. So you might see a crotch it with the fermata above it. And that allows for the musician to hold that note longer than usual. And it almost allows for a lot of expression. 
So having a pause can be more important than having it consistently playing. And sometimes, again, like silences are really important. So if you can imagine a nice phrase it's moving, it's really emotional, and they put a pause there purposely, and then you go back into the piece, it's really moving and it's really effective in kind of like the music that you hear. So that's maybe where you'll see that. And a few, there's loads of other ones. There's loads I could go over. But I'm just pointing a few of them out because some of them are actually written on these pieces of music. And this piece was roughly about, I'd say, a grade six piece, um, for example. And obviously these dynamics are used in those pieces as well. So like we've got one looking here, you've got your tenuto, you've got you've got your dotted notes as well, which of course dotted notes add half the value of your original note. Um there's a lot of like slurring, there's a lot of like legato, so it's a lot of like smooth movements. You've got your pauses, and there's phrasing. There is another thing in this piece, it is called grace notes. You have two different you can have different ones. There is akiakatura and like apiakatura. They're quite weird to say, but akiakatura is what it is is a grace note so it's like a really quick note it's really quick and done with so you can imagine if i was to play a but i had a grace note of g you'd be playing it like you can kind of hear that and that's how it is so it's like you can have da or da you can have it either way but it's like a quick, sharp note that is played just before the actual written note. And it is, um, normally it is marked with a little, it's like a little crotch, well, little quaver tied to the original one. And you can see it um, here. It is right there. You can see a little tiny note and that is your grace note marking. So you play that note just before the original note. And that is something that can be really effective. It can add just a little bit of almost like pizzazz. It can add a little bit more effect. And sometimes having those little quick rhythms can be extra effective in the kind of music writing. And that's pretty much it for this piece. This piece doesn't have too much more dynamics. It does have your it does have a crescendo and it does have a few other ones. There's a few other things that we can learn. And you have like writs, for example. So uh, a written tando or it's writ or you have a round tando and what those is is those are written as writ and it means to gradually slow down so it's like slow down and be great like slow and grand so if you can imagine you're at a certain tempo you may be like bum ba dum bum 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 ba da dum bum bum and there might be a fermata at the end of that kind of thing you can imagine it being like really quick. You can be like da 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 da. That's where you might see a rip. It's basically going at the tempo and then slowing it right down, and then almost being grand because then it can be really effective. I love when that's used. It's one of my favorite things to do is put a rip at the end of a piece and have a pause at the end because it makes it really grand finishes it off. It makes it sound like a perfect cadence, which means it's major. It's happy. It's finished in the songs, you know, it's, it's finished, it's done. And that's really, really effective. And there's a few other markers as well. There's like, you have the eight VE and it might be a little line because uh, there's a little marker here on this page, which has an eighth uh, here, which means octave, play the octave above. So it's not written up in that, like maybe stave. So for example, B is on the middle line, but if you're to read that for the tenor horn, it'd be much higher. So what they do instead is they might put eighth and it means play that the octave above and you would just read it as that but you just play the octave above. And it saves it being a lot of ledger lines because obviously ledger lines are created when you go below the stave and, and there's no more lines. You just add your extra lines. It saves you having to maybe put like three ledger lines to get to your note. It just tells you to play it the octave above so you know just play that note an octave above without it looking complicated and being like, what is that note I'm playing? Oh, it's just a B octave above. And then you do it and then you're like, great. So that's another kind of thing that you see. And if we look at Raider's March, Raider's March has a few good markings that you might see. So there's coda markings and it's called DS Al Coda. And what this means is this is a sign that you might see a lot in some pieces of music depending on how it's written. So a DCL coda is when you return back to the sign. So for example, within Raider's March, there is a little sign there. It's almost like a little S with two uh, dots and a line through it. It's almost like a weird curved S, two dots and a line. And that is basically 
you play the piece all the way to the end, or you play it to the to the to the sign. So you play, I play it all through. So it'd be like bum ba dum bum bum ba dum, and then it's, well, it's like it's like when you get the bum ba da dum bum ba da dum bum da da bum ba da dum bum ba da dum bum ba dum. The piece is not over. One and then the, and then obviously it's got the sign. It's got a pause. So then it then goes bum ba dum bum. And then the reason why that happens is because written down here there is a DCL code a bit, and that means go back to the sign. So you'd go back to where that S is, so you'd be back to the beginning again, without it being like a whole repeat thing and having to repeat the whole section. So you go back to the sign, you play, and obviously you then play to the coda, because it's DC Al Coda. So it's go back to the beginning and play to the coda sign. You then see the coda, it just says to coda, which is a, it's like an O with like two lines through it. And then there is a section dedicated to the coda. And then you played from the coda to the end. And that is it. It's just another way of breaking up a piece of music without uh, being like, right, repeat the whole thing again, because you might not want that to happen. So it breaks up your sections, like your A section, your B section, your A section, and then your C section, for example. You go to your A, B, A, C. And it kind of, it has, it's almost like a little story being told in the piece of music. And it can be really, really um, effective again. And it is really good for this song, especially for Raiders Mark. And again, there's a few markings, there's like tenuto markings, there's actually a thing called mercato markings, which is to play the note forcefully, to play the note again forcefully, it's like an accent. It's just another way of writing it, it's like a V under the note, and again, it's just playing it forcefully. And of course, within this one, there is a lot of expression, so there's like metal 40 for a lot of it, and then you get to, the, there's first time bars and second time bars, so what that means is you play the first time bar, You'd repeat that and go back to the beginning and then play to the second time bar and then continue where that goes. And the second time bar, there is a, a diminuendo into a mezzo piano and you can make that really expressive. You can be really loud and then really quiet. And that's kind of what you'll see in music all the time. So what we're going to do for next week is we're going to actually look at these pieces again and we're going to, I'm going to play them. I'm going to play the tempo markings that are written well, not for next week, for the next lesson, as I should say. We're going to play these pieces as they're written. Uh, maybe not the whole thing, but certainly a good part of it. So we can hear some of these um, tempo markings. And I'll maybe introduce another piece that I've been playing quite recently as well. And it just allows us to maybe check the kind of dynamic markings that are there and allow us to kind of fully express ourselves in music. But that is going to be it for today's lesson. I hope um, that's really opened up your eyes a little bit to kind of the dynamics you see in a lot of pieces of music. And I know I went on about it all the time, but there's a lot of dynamic usage in pieces. Without dynamic usage, you would not have some pieces that you have. So for example, with Raiders March, like it's really expressive and there's a lot of use of dynamics in order to achieve that sound that became so famous. And it's the same with like the Queen in the Knights Aria. If they don't have those markings there, you would not know to play it dramatically or play it loudly or, you know, you know, play it smoothly in some sections. Without those markings, you have no indication on what to do. So it can be really difficult to express the piece in its full glory. You want the piece to show off all of its colours and all of its bits. So that's with some of the dynamic markings that we see and you'll see some of the um, articulation ways of playing. So we went over that before, different ways of playing our notes on the tenor horn, as well as kind of the different sounds we can create. So putting all those all, all together, you get your pieces of music, you get some really expressive work, and it's something that you can really, really enjoy doing, and it's something you can do really musically as well. But other than that, that is it for today. We've gone over a couple pieces, and some really lovely pieces that I've played in the past. We're gonna go over them next time, we're going to play a little section of them and then we're just going to discuss it. So it's more going to be a discussion than a full lesson, but you're still going to learn because you'll get to hear it. You maybe get to hear with a tenor horn and then maybe hopefully you could do that yourself where you can maybe think of new ideas on how to play some pieces that you've already been playing, for example, or maybe how some things work. It might just be a refresher, a reminder, or it might just be for a little bit of enjoyment because I think if we all enjoy music at the end of the day and we're wanting to just kind of just talk about it and look at the different kind of expressions that are used, it's, re it's great. So that's going to be it for me today. So look forward to next lesson, the final uh, lesson of our developing skills for the tenor horn where we will play these pieces. I will recommend them to you as well if you want to go play them uh, and find the music yourself, hopefully online. 
uh, but we'll be playing these next time so look forward to that but for now it's been Joshua this has been Inside the Music I hope you have a fantastic day and I will speak to you later goodbye for now <laughs>